to utter that name brings peace in your soul, just like a wave of peace from head to toe. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome in online this morning. It's good to see everybody today. Good to be back again this Sunday. Seems like the weeks are going by fast. I, I need to slow down just a little bit. You know, last week's devotion was, Are You Ready for Christmas? And we talked about, Are You Ready in a Different Way? Are You Ready for Christ? Well, now I'm, Are You Ready for Christmas? <laughs> for the, you know, the gifts and all that. And I'm along with everybody else, probably not. So, anyway, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Silent night, oh, holy night, and joy to the world. Some of my very favorite Christmas carols and what beautiful songs written about the birth of Christ and about the coming of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. So special. We're going to talk a little bit about the song Joy to the World this morning. Luke 2, 10 and 11 paraphrased, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Yeshua HaMashiach, Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. I love Christmas time. If you know me, I love Christmas. I'm just a Christmas person. It's really my favorite time of year, I think. I like the decorations and spending time with family and friends and eating all the good Christmas goodies, all the food, gaining weight. <laughs> I don't like that part. And I love to sing Christmas songs and carols when one of my favorites is Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. God's people announces it every Christmas time. The words of this hymn are by an English writer by the name of Isaac Watts. It was based on Psalms 98 90 and 96, 11 and 12, and Genesis 3, 17 through 18. The song was first published in 1719. Now, many versions musically have been, not words, but musically have been put out there over the years, and we've ended up with the one where, you know, we have now, but that was not the one from the beginning. This carol celebrates the coming of Jesus the Christ. The joy of the Savior's coming resounds throughout all of creation. Even the fields, rocks, and hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. This is good news for all of God's world. What's so good about this news announced each Christmas? Why this Christmas carol with such exuberance? Watts answers that question in his third stanza, where he declares that Jesus has come to deal with the curse of human sin and rebellion. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus brings the blessing as far as the curse is found. In his hymn, this phrase repeats several times and for good reason. Released from bondage to sin, and the power of death over us, we are now free to live with joy, to love God and our neighbor, and to cultivate the earth God has given us. So let's sing joy to the world with the good news. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. So when you sing that song this year, think about how special it is. It's actually based off of scripture. And, um, and it's old, you know, 17th, 18th century, old, old song, but a beautiful song. And I'm sure we'll be singing that throughout the Christmas season. Well, let's go to our family prayer now. We have lots of needs, as we mentioned earlier, in our families, lots of illness and, and different people in different situations that are going on. So let's pray now for our family, our church family, and the family of God all over the world. Father, once again, we are very grateful to be able to gather together Lord that we can come to you with our prayer and you hear us and you have already sent the answer on the way God I pray for my family today that you will continue to bless them keep them safe Lord Lord that you would provide for them God I pray for our church family today thank you for everyone that is here and those who are not able to be here today I pray that you would be with all of us God just minister to us today and I pray for all of your children all over this world God that we are spreading the good news of the coming of Jesus Christ which no doubt has got to be soon Lord God help us to be ready for that coming Lord I just pray that you would just bless us all today in Jesus name we pray God amen Praise the Lord. Thank you, Linda. Joy to the world. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. 
Well, what a wonderful season. So, uh, I heard it this week that Christmas time is a time when the rest of the world act like Christians act all the time. <laughs> that uh, the rest of the world seem like they'll acknowledge uh, the, the coming of Christ and, and the uh, character of Christ that we should display. Uh, but Christians, we should do this. This is our life. This is what we are. Yes. And uh, aren't you thankful for this season? And uh, this is a season of love, the season of giving. And I'm, I'm just glad to see uh, uh, that, uh, folks, if we ever needed this time it's right now we need some cheer and uh, and i have good news that jesus is still alive he's still well and uh, he still saves uh souls he still forgives sins he still heals bodies he still heals broken hearts and he still sets captives free and, and uh, I'm, everything that he ever did do, he's still doing. And aren't you good to know? Aren't you glad to know that today? That I can't say it in, in all the ways that Jesus, I mean, that Linda put the accent on it. Uh, uh, well, say that again, honey. Uh, the, yeah, Meshua Mashiach. Uh, that. Uh, Ask me in five minutes and I won't remember what that was again. But the angel said, call his name Jesus, not because they picked it out of a hat. But he's told him why. For he shall save his people from their sins. And that's the good news, that he's still doing that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Turn with me this morning to the book of 2 Chronicles, and this morning we'll conclude the uh, message that we began last week. Second Chronicles chapter 5. I'm going to read the same uh, few verses, beginning in verse 11 through verse 14, and then we'll go from there. Uh, stand with me, please, when you found this. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph and Heman and Jebdathan with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them an hundred and twenty priests, sounding with trumpets. It came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of of God. Thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> may God bless the reading of His Word and <clears throat> the title that I've put on this message is that song, For He is Good, for His mercy endureth forever. At the risk of re-preaching what I preached last week, I will kind of uh, kind of hit the highlights that will bring us up to date to where we uh, got to last week. Um, we spoke first of all about how that this was uh, transpiring at the dedication of the temple that Solomon had built for the Lord. We call it Solomon's temple, but it wasn't Solomon's temple. It's God's 
temple. Uh, the ownership belongs to God. It was His residence that they were desiring uh, to house in this structure. Solomon was the one who God had chosen uh, to uh, complete this structure. We know that uh, it was placed upon David's heart as he looked around and saw all the uh, dwelling places that he had and the rest of the children of Israel had and the, and the walled cities that they had and that God was still in this portable tabernacle made of tents and David wanted to build God a temple. And we realize that God said because David was a man of war that he was not going to be allowed to build this temple. The point that the Lord brought out to us in that was David, when he realized he wasn't going to be the one that God used to accomplish that task, said, how can I be of assistance to he whom God will use? And I believe that's an attitude that every child of God should have. Every minister should have. Every worship leader should have. Every Sunday school teacher should have. Every child from the little toddlers on up to those that have been serving the Lord for years. God give us the heart of a servant. A lot of people desire to be in position that they can be recognized for what they can contribute or what they may bring or what they may be do. But let me tell you, there's only one position available left in the kingdom of God and that if we could apply for it would be the position of servant. The man that's recorded as the man after God's own heart had the heart of a servant. If I can't be the one, how can I be of assistance to he who will God, who God will use? And so we uh, mentioned how that David had gathered materials and plans and did as, as far as he could. And then when Solomon began to build the temple and he finished the temple, that he gave honor to David by bringing in all the things that David his father had honored. And then we realize that the second thing is that Solomon honored God uh, by bringing in the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. It had been uh, made portable up until this time. But the scriptures teach us that when they set it in its proper place in the Holy of Holies in this new temple erected by uh, Solomon and dedicated to God that they did something, Sister uh, Carol, that was very uh, striking. It said they removed the staves. Staves were what was placed on each side of the Ark of the Covenant. They were wooden poles that the priest used to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Steve, as they placed it in that place, they removed the staves. And symbolically, that when we get to the place that God is set up residence with our hearts, we need to remove the staves. The search is over. The traveling is over. We're home in the presence of the Almighty. Do you have the staves removed this morning? Surely when we realize that we find Jesus, we found it all, Sister Gladys. We don't have to look any longer. Our journeys have ended at the feet of the Savior of the world. Praise the Lord. Anyway, so they honored the Lord in uh, bringing in uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's presence among them. We realize that uh, brought out uh, how that everything in this new tabernacle uh, was new and improved. Uh, instead of curtains, they had uh, walls inlaid with gold and all this illustrious ornamentation all around. But the ark was the same. The point that the Lord brought out to us is that you can't improve on God's 
presence. Also, I want us to realize that God's presence fit in just as well with this new and improved and illustrious tabernacle as it did with that one that was just surrounded by curtains that they carried through the wilderness. I want us to understand you can't improve on the presence of God. He fit in just as well in the point I made last week. He fits in just as well as the with the extravagant as he does with the homely. Jesus Christ was just as comfortable with the rich man, Zacchaeus, as he was with the poor man, Bartimaeus. He fits in every situation and he identifies with every life, whatever state, whatever condition is in. He identifies with the poor and he identifies with the rich. He identifies with the Jew and he identifies with the Gentile. He's not just a white man's savior, but he's a black man, a red man, a yellow man's savior. He's not just a savior to the uneducated, but he's a savior to the intellects also. He's not just a savior to the old person, but he's a savior to the young pe person. Revelation 22 and 17 declare, the spirit and the bride say come. Let him that heareth come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him drink of the water of life freely. John chapter 3 and verse 16 makes it available to whosoever will. Let him come unto Jesus. Folks, I want us to understand you don't have to be shy about presenting Jesus to anybody. Everybody needs a Savior. And Jesus is the Savior of the world. Isn't that why the scriptures say that they called him Jesus? For he shall save his people from their sins. Hallelujah. Well, I said I wasn't going to re-preach and I'm trying to, trying to move on. Uh, uh, but we, we, we kind of mentioned that, uh, that as great as this tabernacle was, as great and all the workmen and, and, and as illustrious as it was, uh, uh, Caleb, it's what's on the inside that really counted. And, and, and we realize and we find, and I even brought the point out, is that when we're dealing with relationships with, with one another, if we could see the, the, the reflection of the inside, then it might make us uh, be more appealing to others, if they if they would let them see what's really inside of us. I was uh, uh, thinking of a movie, and I I can't think of the name of it, but I it's several years old. And in this movie, there was a man that that uh, a boy that he was only able to see people's external features based upon shallow how. It just came to me. Has anyone ever seen that movie Shallow? How? Is a is a is a is a young man, and and somehow or another that he something happened to him, and it, if people were beautiful on the inside, that he saw them as beautiful on the outside, but if people were ugly on the inside that he saw them as ugly on the outside. And so he was attracted to this one girl that was beautiful on the inside. And in his eyes, he just saw the most beautiful girl in the world. But she wasn't attractive, really. Um, and so the movie was kind of comical, how that his friends would understand, why are you... You know, why do you like her? And he and, and all throughout this movie, and then but it taught us a valuable, valuable lesson. It's what's on the inside that counts. Now I got lucky. <laughs> I think it's the only time I've ever heard Linda say amen. No. <laughs> Because my wife is as beautiful on the outside as she is on the inside. And I know that you feel the same way about your companion, your spouse. 
Uh, but folks, uh, the, it's what's on the inside that really matters. And I don't want to belabor that point. But spiritually, we realize that uh, this is just a building. Put your hand on your heart. Put your hand on your heart. Say, this is just a tabernacle. This is just a vessel of clay. It's what's on the inside that really matters. And so uh, when we have Jesus set up residence within our hearts, that's, that's symbolized by when they brought the Ark of the Covenant in, into that temple. Oh, and, and listen, and when they removed the staves, folks, I removed the staves a long time ago. When Jesus set up residence, I realized that there's no turning back. We're not looking anymore. We're not searching anymore. I found it all. When I found Jesus, so uh, going on, going on, we realize that uh, uh, we'll never get so uh, great, so endued, so uh, numerically blessed that we will outgrow the need for the presence of the Lord in our lives. Um, then we got to the end and Solomon in the dedication of this temple showed reverence to God by offering uh, uh, sheep and oxen uh, unnumerable. Uh, they couldn't even count them all. And nothing happened. No thunderings, no lightnings, no move of God setting up residence. And, uh, and we brought out the point that God desires a higher sacrifice than us than what we can do for Him. We realize the ark was placed Still nothing happens. God's presence didn't fill it. There wasn't thundering. There wasn't lightning. Nothing happened because the three main ingredients that will always move God had not happened. And those three ingredients I'm going to be uh, preaching about next... No. <laughs> no, we're going to start right there and conclude this message for all the week. For the uh, seven days since I left you, I know that you've uh, been uh, searching the scriptures, that you've identified what these are, and we're just going to expound on them a little week, a little bit further this morning. First of all, verse 11, as we read, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. We realized the first thing, God didn't go in until the priest came out. God didn't go in until the priest came came out. God will not share His glory with another. Who resides in the temple of your heart? Either you or God. It's one or the other. We must not live by what we want, our motives, our life, but as Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Holiness cannot be accomplished in our lives until we deal with the flesh through the power of sanctification. Paul said, I die daily. Jesus will not enter into an occupied heart. Jesus said, if any man will come to me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross. And follow me. The greatest man that Jesus identified that was ever born of a woman. John the Baptist said, I must decrease that he may increase. We understand that this happened, this statement was made as John was baptizing in the river Jordan and Jesus came to him. John saw him coming a far way off and said to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. 
And as John baptized Jesus in that Jordan River, the, 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 the presence of God lit upon him like a, in the form of a dove. And God's voice thundered out of heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Afterwards, John's disciples, many of them began to follow Jesus and stopped following John. And someone came to him and said, don't you see what's happening? They've left you and now they're following him. And that's when he made the profound statement, I must decrease. It's not about me. It's all about him. The fulfillment of John's whole message was walking away down that dusty trail and everything that John had done should push people to following after him. We find a great example given in the, in the testimony of John and I believe it should be displayed in each and every one of our lives. We must decrease. We've got too many personalities behind pulpits. Oh Lord, I hope I'm anointed. <laughs> We've got too many personalities leading worship. We've got too many personalities writing books and, and teaching Sunday school. We must decrease. I have always felt like that I have been a miserable failure of a minister is if when you leave these doors, you leave talking about me. Our job, our heart's desire, the whole focus of everything we do is to draw attention to Jesus. We're preaching about Jesus. We're singing about Jesus. We're teaching about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We must decrease. We've got to get out of the way. Get rid of all the attention is to Him. Even Jesus in the flesh, in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Gethsemane, declared, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. As individuals and as churches, we must learn to get out of God's place. We find individuals trying to do the role of God in their own life. What is the role of God in our life? First of all, is to save us. We use the word save, but that means we should change. You see, salvation, we, we know this, and, but I think sometimes it's the very first elementary thing about Christianity. You must be born again. That's His job. That we're born again when we repent of our sins. A lot of people want forgiveness of their sins, but a lot of people don't want to repent of their sins. You say, well, Brother Greg, what's the difference? Forgiveness is just uh, making them go away, taking them from us. But, and that's what God does. He forgives, but we repent. A lot of people want God to do His part. Oh, Lord, I hope I'm anointed. But what about our part? Repent means that we do a 180, that we were going this way and we're going to turn from sin, turn from filthiness, turn from corrupt communication, turn from lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, all of the things that lead us away from God and turn it from the world and we repent from that. I don't want to ever do that again. I don't want to ever go there again. I don't want to ever live like that again and we begin going this way that's repenting Jesus said as I already quoted if any man will follow me let him deny himself you gotta repent turn 
turn from his wicked ways. Oh, hallelujah. And follow me. Many people, many people are trying to do the work of the Lord. I'm going to clean up my act. <laughs> I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to join a group and we're going to challenge each other to become better. When it comes to spiritual things, you cannot help yourself. Jesus said in the first general invitation in Matthew chapter 11, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You shall find rest unto your souls. As individuals, we got to get out of God's place. Let Him do what He does. We do what we do. We turn. We make a decision. I never want to sin again. Did you hear me? A lot of people turn to the Lord in crisis fully intending to go back to the pigsty after the crisis is over. That's not repenting. Jesus can make us new. Churches, we've got to get out of God's place. Righteousness cannot be legislated or dictated by a church. A church cannot dictate how to live holy. A church can give you rules and regulations. A church can make us all uh, dress the same way, talk the same way, wear the same things, go the same places. But a church, and that's religion, but a church cannot make you holy. God has never entrusted the reins of righteousness to a church or into the hands of men, but only to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And only he can. Moving on, if we want the presence of God in our lives, first of all, we've got to get out of the way. Let God do what God does. Secondly, the thing that will usher in the presence of God is praise. In verse 12, also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph and Heman and Jedithan, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, linen, having cymbals and psalters and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. Before, in offering sheep and oxen, the attention was on what Solomon could do and what the people could do. But as they began to sing, the focus and the attention was off of the sheep and the oxen and how many of them there were, Sister Treva, someone was trying to keep count. But as they began to sing, all of a sudden the focus, the attention was placed a little higher. 
that the eyes that were looking at, at all the sheep and all of the oxen and, and all of the worth and all of the, the count and all of the money that was invested in all of that and, and who had provided it and how much they must have gone into to gather all of that and put it all together. My, my, what a sight. But oh, oh, oh what's, what's that I hear? What? For he is good. Oh, listen, listen, it's getting louder. It's getting louder. For he is good. His mercy endureth forever. All of a sudden, we're beginning to look a little higher. Everything was vertical, uh, horizontal before. Is that That's what they can do. And maybe I can't do it that much, but I can do it to some extent. But all of a sudden, that horizontal became vertical for. He is good. His mercy, oh hallelujah, endures forever. The shortest song, one verse over and over and over, directing our attention just as it did that day off of ourselves and what we can do or what we can't do or what degree we can do it and placing it on Him. He is good. Folks, that's praise. That's praised. God is not impressed with our achievements. God is not moved by our structures. God is not moved by our numbers. But God is moved by our praise. When we praise Him, we take the attention off of ourselves, off of our needs, off of our accomplishments, and place it upon a higher plane, upon God, His power, His ability, His presence. All oh, that people would praise the Lord. Turn with me to Psalms 107. I, I didn't know if I was going to be doing this or just referring to it, but I want us to get into the heart of a man whom God said his heart is after mine. Psalm 107. Oh, can we just follow with me? Oh, he, he began, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemies. And went on and, and he describes it and, and he says for, in verse 9, he satisfieth the longing soul, filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction. Oh, therefore he brought down their heart to labor. They cried in the Lord in their trouble and he uh, saved them out of their distress. Verse 15, all oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his, for his wonderful works to the children of men, men. And that's the same as what he said uh, in, in verse 8. And then goes on and presents other situations. And then verse 21, it's like each verse it has a chorus. And the chorus goes like this. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of in. And then the same deal, another verse. And then ver uh, the chorus again in verse 31. All oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And goes on and on. And, and we see this. You can read that on your own. I wanted to refer to it. But something is within my heart that's causing me to be stirred deep within my spirit. Oh, Oh, that men would praise the Lord. 
that we would get our attention a little higher. That as we keep it on this horizontal plane, we're looking around at all that's going on, all that's not going on, all that should be going on, and it worries us, and it gets our attention down. But praise, I hear something as we begin to praise. Oh, He is good. Oh, folks, I want to sing that chorus over and over and over. He is good hallelujah there's always things that can distract us oh but every now and then we need a good dose of praise You can always look around and see that something is not the way that it should be. You, you can feel within your body that, oh, I wish things were a little better. <laughs> But every now and then, we need to reach a little higher plane. Oh, looking past all of that, all that's going on in our country, all that's going on in this world, all that's going on within our bodies. Oh, we need a good dose of praise, for He is good. And His mercy endureth. Forever. Praise was the second ingredient to usher in the presence of God. The first ingredient was get out of His place. Let God be God. Let God do what God does. And then secondly, we begin to acknowledge it's not about us. It's all about Him. He is good and His mercy endureth forever. Only one event left to take place before the visible presence of God arrived. Verse 13. It came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets, and symbols, an instrument of music, and praise the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, this last event to take place. The trumpeters and singers were as one. And their message was the same message. Their song was the same song. Unity was the last ingredient. Listen, praise preceded unity. <coughs> unity did not precede praise. The order was praise and then unity. Everyone say unity. We preach unity. We pray for unity. Sing about unity. Teach about unity. But we learn that praise ushers in unity. I don't know how long it took them to get to that place. It does, scriptures doesn't say. I don't know how many times they had to repeat that before it caught on. I don't know if they had to tune the trumpets just right, but at some point in time, as they begin to sing that phrase, as they begin to play that phrase over 
and over and over. At some point in time, it reached a crescendo at that magical place when every note was in sync, when every voice was in tune, when every heart was in the right place, and unity prevailed at that time. See, a lot of people will try to bring unity by what we can do. That, well, we'll be all unified if I can just get everyone to believe and talk and act like I do. The only problem is every individual. <laughs> has that attitude. All the churches will be unified if they'll just begin to interpret <laughs> like we do. The problem is every other church in town feels the same way. Once again, praise brings unity. For he is good. The singers began to sing, and they weren't trying to sound like that singer. Might have started off like that. The trumpeters were playing. And they might have thought, you know, he's got a real good tone over there. I'm going to try to listen to that tone and see if I can match it. I like it. All they're doing is being like one another. What brings unity? The unity that we want. The unity that we must have. It's not that we're trying to be like one another. But that we're trying to be like Him. And however far you may have to go, However much your instrument may be out of tune, however many changes you may to be, you may need to make in your life, it doesn't matter. As, as long as you're trying to be like him, the closer you get to him, the closer that you're going to get to those that are trying to be like him. So when our message, our focus, our vision, our desire is to be like Him, we're all going to be like each other. For we shall be like Him. In Acts chapter 2. How many, did you read that number? Did you read that number over there? In how many uh, of the uh, priests were there? Did you catch that? Did you catch that? In verse 11, what, no, where, where, where was that? 12? Yeah, there it is. Stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests. Sounding with, where's that number ring a bell? In Acts chapter two, Linda, you want to finish this? <laughs> In Acts chapter two, 
There was 120 in the upper room. Jesus told them, tarry here until ye be endued with power from on high. For several days, Cindy, they'd prayed. They'd fasted. Then sang songs. And on the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, these 120, their minds, their spirits, their voices, their hearts were in <laughs> one accord. Unity. For he is good. His mercy endureth forever. I don't know what they had to do to accomplish it. I don't know. Maybe some of them had to say, hey, Peter, I thought bad about you and I said some bad things about you. Would you forgive me? Oh, maybe Peter said, I thought all of y'all were weak. I thought none of you'd stand. I need you to forgive me of my arrogance. I don't know. I don't know what they had to do, Sister Marilyn. But whatever they had to do, they did it because they wanted to be like Jesus. And I don't know what we may have to do, what you have to do, what I have to do, what this church world has to do, but I will tell you, we're not going to be like him until we begin to look to him and we take our attention off of our programs, off of our platforms, off of our agendas, and say for he is good. That's my message. glory of God filled the house, sat upon them cloven tongues like as of fire. Acts chapter 4, the same thing happened. Uh, uh, Peter and John had been uh, beaten and the church had been praying for them and they let them go. The church had gathered and, and they came to them in Acts chapter 4 and told them and the whole uh, congregation began to worship the Lord, began to praise the Lord and the Bible tells us and the house was shaken. I would love for this house to be shaken shaken. But this structure will not be shaken until this structure is shaken. In 2 Chronicles we find that as unity prevailed, as, as people got out of God's place and let God do what God does, as they began to sing and praise and take the attention off of themselves and place it upon God, and as they got the attention onto God, they started being more and more in unity. And when all of these things happened, the glory of God filled the house. The priest got out of the way. The people began to praise. Uh, and the Shekinah glory of God filled the house with a cloud so powerful that the priest couldn't go in and out. Hallelujah. His presence was and is more glorious than all the gold, the brass, and the silver. His countenance shines brighter than the sun. His majesty is untouched and even unmatched, even by our imagination. He is Lord, and there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. You're right to sing that song this morning, Sister Jennifer. At that name, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What I was preaching about today is a miraculous 
physical manifestation of the glory of God. Jesus spoke to a woman at a well one time. And he told her that there's going to be a time when the Spirit will be in you, Sister Mary. That if you're looking for that smoke, that power to, it may or may not. But let me tell you, now he dwells in temples of flesh. His presence has moved out of that ark of the covenant holy of holies realm. And now he resides within the hearts of those who love and fear him, serve him. I said earlier, I want God to fill this house. Lynn, like he filled that house. So that means I've got to do those three things, right? I've got to let God be God in my life. That I've got to learn to live on a higher plane. To get above the fray. And realize that song hasn't changed. He's good. His mercy endureth forever. And now as I begin to sing that song, that means that I begin to mold myself to Him and not Him to me. That I begin to allow Him to chip away little things within my heart and my life and my attitude and my actions that aren't like Him so that I can be like Him. Oh, and then as we get to that point, (laughs) from time to time, Sister Carol, when the trumpeters and singers become one, when we get in tune, I'm talking as individuals, maybe in a time of prayer closet, Maybe in a time riding down the road, listening to a song. Maybe in a time of, of communication in an altar of prayer at church. Or, but sometimes, from time to time, Sister George, His presence overwhelms us. How long has it been? since you felt the waves of glory (laughs) flooding your soul so that you couldn't talk. You couldn't minister. There's been times, Brother Steve, there wasn't no need to preach because the glory of the Lord had filled the house. There's times when you're singing a worship song and that union is just right that you have to stop singing because all you can do is cry as glory fills the house. We need, desperately need, His presence in our lives. Let's bow our heads. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. John 
said that you were Emmanuel, God with us. And you still are. Lord, you see that there are many needs in our community, in our families, in our world today. Lord, your desire is to meet each and every one of these needs. But God, sometimes we get it all wrong. Sometimes we're thinking of all that needs to be done on a group scale. But your word teaches us that you change the world one person at a time. And with that in mind, God, and with this message in mind, I pray, start with me, God. I'm a singer. I'm a trumpeter. And I know the words to the song. But knowing the words to the song does not bring the song to life. But I want to match my spirit to the message of the song. You are good. You are good. I know that evil is in the world, but God, you are good. I know that we've tried a lot of different things and a lot of different programs and a lot of different methods, but God, I want to try the tried and true method. You're good. I want to be like you. And I know that twos and tens and Hundreds and thousands and millions of people on this world can get that same attitude. I want to be like Jesus. And as we reach that place of unity, oh, your glory, oh, the glory. And then the main thing becomes the main thing. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the victory that comes to lives that have denied themselves, that have taken up their crosses and followed you. Teach us your ways, Lord, and that we may walk in them. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss, I would like to repeat the words of that chorus together. For He is good. Can we do it? For He is good and His mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. Have a victorious week. Let's come again next Sunday gathered together to exalt the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Service begins right now. God bless you.